Hi everyone and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the event producer. Thanks everyone for tuning in with us, whether it's your first time tonight or you've been with us since our very first Nightlife and Friends in April. We are so grateful to have um, all of you cho choose your time. Sorry, messed that up. We're so grateful to all of you for choosing to spend your time with us. This year has definitely not been easy, but I think Christine and I can agree that spending our Thursday nights with all of you um, has been a silver lining. Tonight is a special night school. It's the last one for 2020, um, but not our last one. We'll be back in 2021. Um, and tonight we're bringing a nightlife favorite to you at home. Holiday Bazaar has been a staple at Nightlife for the last nine years, and we couldn't imagine going through this season without one. So we've partnered with our longtime friends at San Francisco Bazaar to do a night school twist on our annual event. And here to join us is Jamie Chan, founder of SF Bazaar. Jamie, you're muted. <laughs> Oh, Zoom life. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And so tonight, we really welcome you all to enjoy our presenters, which are vendors, people who have sold their handmade goods with us for the last 13 years at our handmade markets. But we also have a market online, so you can visit us. Um, I think the link will be put in the chat box or across the banner. And you can click through, and we have wonderful discounts for local handmade artisan made goods in the SF Bay area, support local made. Uh, we would love it if you just click through and visit. We also have a raffle, right, Christina? Yes, there's a banner. Oh wait, no, that's the wrong banner. Okay. Here's the banner. <laughs> So if you click through on the link, you'll get a form and you can enter your name and email, one entry per email, please. And then you can get a chance to win a $50 gift card to a vendor of your choice. So everybody listed in our marketplace would be a potential place you could get this $50 credit. Be a wonderful way to kick off that holiday shopping if you haven't done it already. Yeah, I'm going to drop this link in case you don't memorize it. Um, and for any latecomers, I'm going to drop it in the comments. It's also in the YouTube description. So enter throughout the night. And then Jamie, you'll be back at the end, right? Yep. To announce a winner. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jamie, we'll see you at the end. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, anyway, tonight our lineup um, features five local artists and crafters. Um, we have metalsmith Alexis Pavlantos, who creates delightful and beautiful wearable metal creatures. We have artist Cody Vrosh, who's going to paint um, some of your favorite Academy animals. Um, and then you might want to take maybe right now to go grab some craft paper and scissors and markers um, because Risa Culbertson is going to show you how to send a hug in the mail if you can't give one uh, in real life. Um, Amy Perrier of Bernal Burrow is here and she's going to demonstrate how to bring a little nature into your home with some moss art. And then finally, Katie Kristen is going to show you how to make your own everlasting terrarium ornament. Um, and then as Jamie mentioned, in between we'll have little segments that show off all the artists in the artist market. Um, so sit back and you can enjoy the computer window shopping. And as always, tonight's program is live. So please say hi, let us know where you're watching from. If it's your first time joining us or you're a repeat friend, uh, we don't have any Q and A's tonight, but please feel free to ask any questions to our makers in the chat um, and hopefully they'll get a chance to answer them throughout the night. Um, let's get started with Alexis. Great. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexis Pavlantos, and I am coming here hot in my studio. Um, good to see you all. Well, see, hear you virtually. <laughs> um, uh, a big part of what I do is all about connection, and through that is a lot of me creating a lot of creatures and a lot of weird things in metal. But I definitely think that right now, with everything that's going on, it's really nice for us to all um feel connected um so a big part of making art for me is kind of showing that connection to all things um hello everyone that's joining in 
Um, that's really cool that everyone is coming in from like everywhere. <laughs> I love that. Um, what a great way to reference connection. Um, so I was kind of going to show you a little bit about my process and a little bit about what I do. Uh, a big part of me is um, finding where I find awe and kind of like diving into that a little bit deeper. Definitely nature is my biggest source of inspiration. I have like a lot of Ooh, that's terrible, actually, here. Camera, I have multiple cameras going on. Um, I have a lot of natural specimen that I like to collect that um, when sculpting things. Uh, so everything I do, there's a lot of different types of working in metal that you can do, and I, I create everything by hand. So a big part of me for me is not to take something and turn it into metal, because you can't do that. That's called natural casting but to actually be able to carve something in wax. Um, I actually went to school for sculpture and then later on moved to San Francisco or actually Oakland um, and wanted to make um, objects still sculptural, but wearable and small so that I could work um, in my studio. Uh, so a big part of like using all my sculpture um, background was finding these different um, objects or creatures that I could reference. So um, a lot of times I like to actually have the thing if I can in order to sculpt it. Um, kind of here at my bench, I have like this really cool stag beetle head that a friend actually gave me. And then um, I spent many, many hours using different waxes. So Sometimes I use like a soft wax that's kind of like putty or kids sculpty clay. And then sometimes I use really hard wax that um, is like machining wax that you have to use carving tools and um, lots of lots of time to manipulate. So I kind of use those two different materials. So I think a lot of what I do is observe. I find myself to be an observer. Um, either observing things around me that I find as inspiration or sometimes observing how me materials respond in my hands. So as you can see, like right now, one of them is moving really easily and one of them's hard. Um, so I always like to refer to material as like, just kind of like people, they all have different personalities. Some are softer, some are harder, and they all like to move in different ways. Um, so a big part of being an observer is kind of looking at different things and how they react. Um, so I start by working in wax. Um, here's like a piece that I would have in wax. This is actually a chameleon head. So I try to put like a lot of humor in my pieces. It's a ring. Um, so your finger's supposed to be the tongue. Um, and I just really, really enjoy using wax and then making a plaster mold of it and melting metal, which I will show you tonight, just how quickly metal melts and then pouring the um, metal into a mold so that I can get an object that is cast. So this guy's pretty dirty. This is a hedgehog that I spent a lot of time carving each spike out of wax. And he will, this is like, you have to add different parts of metal in order to turn something from wax into metal so that it has a, a channel to go into. So this is a little hedgehog box that I've created and believe it or not, he will fit perfectly together. This guy's name is Fred. I actually did live with a hedgehog for a little bit and his name was Fred and they're just the coolest creatures. Um, so a big part, um, of what I do is just to like find different creatures that really inspire me. A lot of my creatures have like um, armor. I really, really love, like these are my roly poly earrings. Oops, sorry, I'm still getting used to the camera. Um, these are my roly poly earrings and they're really cool. They like curl up around your ear. Oh, I guess I got this camera too. And they have some kinetic movement so I think one part of sculpting for me for a while was like, how do I make something functional? And then a big part of that was like, how do I also make it interact with the body in a cool way and make it move? 
Um, so these are actually like in sterling silver and they, I just love roly polies. I, I think I have like a long connection with them from my childhood and I think they're just the best and a lot of other armored creatures. So this guy is a crab and my forms are all hollow. So I don't know if you can tell, but they're actually like really light. So inside of the crab is like a negative cavity, which I'm, I'm now working farther into making them into lockets and things that can open up to like utilize that negative space. Um, but this one's just like a solid ring for now. Well, semi, semi solid, semi hollow. Um, and yeah, I, I just like, and again, another armored, strong, strong folk. Um, and then I also brought my favorite. Everyone loves this one. This is the armadillo lizard. If you have not seen these, they are phenomenal. They are these creatures that live across the world, a, a few of them um, range in parts of Africa. And they are a species that when they feel threatened, curl up and bite their tail. Um, so a big part of this for me was like, how do I make this thing like work with the body instead of just like being an object? Um, so it has like lots of movement and can move around. Um, everyone always says that this one reminds them of like the Game of Thrones, <laughs> which I think is a big compliment um so pretty fun and so a little bit more about my process too so this is actually like wax um after I inject it uh it's kind of hard to show you but I might try so over there whoops behind that cord oops not there there is a little machine and I actually like use pressure and heat to melt the wax and what that does is that will um go ahead and melt the wax and then I can make more pieces if I want. Um, and then I can make rubber molds too. So it's kind of a lengthy process. There are definitely a lot of really cool places in the Bay Area that you can take casting classes and learn the technique. Um, but before that, I did want to tell you um, and show you since a lot of what I do is about observation. I wanted to show you um, what metal looks like at different variables and I need my match. And so I'm just using a regular flame, but I did want to see if you all could observe what happens to this metal as the heat. So like what I was saying is a lot of it, what I do is observing things. And right now you can really tell metal gets red right before it melts and then eventually it balls up into like a little roly-poly. I don't know if you could see that, but it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> and if you all have any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer them for you. I also really appreciate everyone for coming tonight. It's been really, really fun interacting and seeing what everyone's been working on during this interesting time. Cool. And I hope to see you all in person next year, too. <laughs> Thank you. Greetings, humans of Earth. Uh, but, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo here. Just work this out. Hello? There we go. Okay. Greetings, humans of Earth. I'm Cody Brosh. Uh, tonight, um, I was going to show you, uh, we've got Claude here. This is my favorite uh, alligator best friend from the Academy itself. He's a great guy. I like him a lot. Unfortunately, I've never had the chance of getting real close to him. I, I, I fear he might be a little chompy. Even This is even before social distancing. You couldn't even really get that close to him. But uh, um despite how I may try. No, don't go near alligators, but you gotta give them space. So tonight I wanna give them some space. Uh, I'm gonna paint a galaxy background and make Claude an astronaut here. Um, I will be following along in the chat. So if you guys have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Alexis, that was awesome. That, uh, that the armadillo lizard bracelet and the chameleon ring, those are dope. I love uh, I love armadillo lizards. 
But watercolor, let's talk watercolor. So right now I'm just making a, uh, making the surface nice and wet. So you may be wondering right now if you're logging into your favorite science museum and seeing a dude paint, you may go, why is this dude painting? What does art and science have to do with each other? Well, I'm gonna pitch that a lot actually. So what I'm dealing with right now is actually uh, not just painting. It's not just slapping paint down. It's actually playing in puddles. It's it's a uh, uh, set my timer on. Um, it's water tension. So watercolor itself, I like to not consider even a paint. I like to consider it as a uh, more of an ink, really. Um, and uh, and so it's basically particles suspended in water. I've been watching videos on uh, the Cheerios effect and how uh, the meniscus holds water. It's kind of a similar concept. Um, but as water's drying or as you've got different uh, wetness levels of the paper, so you can see, like just when I drop some ink around, you can see how it kind of starts to bleed and spread out. And it depends on how wet your paper is and how uh, how much uh, dispersion you're gonna get with that. It's called blossoming. Blossoming or blooming, that's when the pigment kind of spreads out. And as it dries, it also has different effects too. So you can, depending on the moisture level, it can be concentrated in areas. Sometimes it creates a ring. Um, and uh, And so it's all really particle physics. And uh, if you if you have watercolors handy, you can actually do this with me. I'm just going to do a nice little spectrum here, and then I'll show you how to get stars in there. If you can see, there's some little dots here. And what that is is masking fluid, and that's actually a it's basically a paintable rubber. And uh, and I like to splatter it around and give myself some nice uh, some nice pre-stars. And you can also do it with white paint too. I use a white acrylic ink, which is nice and thick. And uh, and you can see just the, the colors are kind of bleeding together. Um, as you've got two pieces of wet color, you can just kind of add stuff in. And yeah, and it blossoms and blooms and carries its way into the other pieces of water. But yeah, I think science and art have a lot to do with each other. The way I think about it is that science is uh, science is what we use to discover the truths of the world, but art is what we use to discover the truths of ourselves, and they overlap a great deal. I mean, right now we're all stuck in quarantine. We're waiting for scientists to get us out of it, but we're leaning heavily on art. Who hasn't binged? some Netflix during this trying time. And uh, and for that matter, the Academy itself, like uh, it's an amazing building, architect built that. And I think that scientists and artists in themselves have a great deal in common. They're both curious. They're both always trying to push into some new direction, always trying to discover something new. Right now, I am making an experiment. And every piece of art is really an experiment. You know, this is my laboratory. And so I'm trying to do this as fast as possible. We've got 10 minutes here. But this is how quick you can do it, really. The hard part is waiting for things to dry. Watercolors, and sometimes you paint something and it just takes hours. And yeah, you can do this at home pretty easily. All you need is watercolor paint and some water. A drawing of really anything. I like drawing clouds, but you know, you don't have to necessarily. You can feel free to draw whatever you want. 
I'll show you some uh, finished examples in a minute. The thing I love about watercolor too is you can keep adding on to it. So this is feeling not quite dark enough, so I'm going to darken that up a little bit. And yeah, make sure you check out the SF Bazaar site for um, there should be links everywhere for all the other vendors and crafters and stuff. This is we all wish we could be if not if only to see Claude. We wish we could be at the academy itself, but um, but in the meanwhile, we can all hang out virtually and shop at each other's sites. Uh, this is how I like to splatter paint. Uh, so heavily saturated brush. Um, and then another brush, and you just tap, tap it out. You can also, if you want to check out more of my art, it's CodyVrosh.com. If you want to check out um, the website where, if you're familiar with our stuff, we sell shirts and art and books and all sorts of other things. And... Uh, you can find that at binarywinter.com. That's like snowflakes of information, binary, binary winter. And if you use the code festive, you get 15% off right now. So cool. And yeah, this is what I love. So we've got puddles here. And uh, and this was a little bit wetter than over here, say. So you've got um, these, uh, you know, this is blossoming and bleeding a little bit, but then this is pooling and curling like a little river river on the page it's beautiful and amazing it's just rivers of pigment and uh and yeah you should experiment with art you should take the time to make weird stuff and just mess around with it perform your own experiments the point is not to become brilliant or be to make beautiful i mean eventually maybe you know you want to make some beautiful works of art but i love not making beautiful works of art and just kind of, you know, exploring the territory of what it means, you know, and you don't walk to become the best walker. You don't talk to become the best talker. You, you do these things because it's, that's how you survive. And art is a part of survival. And so when you're done with this, go, go paint some space, go, um, Maybe uh, the first one you do will look amazing. The second one will look pretty good. <laughs> After a few, you'll go, hey, I don't know, am I that good at this? And you'll keep doing it, keep doing it. You have to keep doing art. Um, but yeah, this is when we get the fun part where we just get to uh, uh, where we get to wait for it to dry, but um, I can show you some other uh, pieces that I painted earlier. Uh, I painted these turtles, this turtle. Um, and so you can see the, uh, uh, the, the masking fluid, and you can either take this off with your hand, you can take it off with an eraser, and uh, and you've got nice clean stars. The reason why I like splattering versus actually painting in the detail of stars is it's it's a uh, random. When you look up at the sky, there's we force order onto it, but in and of itself, it has no order. It is it is the beautiful chaos that is the universe. And, uh, and I think we should embrace that when making it. But if you want to splatter your art too, I've got a glass art table, which works wonderfully as a part-time easel. But then you can also just Make your own stars there. 
And this depending on, again, water tension, uh, the amount of pigment that you've got in your brush, you can do different shapes. And make your own little starscapes. It's just playing in puddles. And I also wanted to show you I was painting this earlier. Here's another little trick that I love doing. I was painting penguins because penguins are awesome. Um, and so I heavily saturated this paper. Then I added a little, some salt crystals to it, which does a whole another different thing. It beads, it like crystallizes basically the um, the the paint itself. And uh, and then I used shrink wrap wrap on top of that because I wanted a kind of crystalline icy effect to it. And has it dried? Yes, it's dried. So we can pull that off, free the penguins, and we've got ourselves some penguins. And again, take off the stars. That's a little wet. No weight on that one. But, uh, and yeah, and it's all these easy little tricks you can do just to kind of explore, uh, explore where your mind goes while you're while you're painting and that's the i think the most important part of it all experiment um so yeah that's my time i want to give a special thank you to all the scientists <laughs> scientists and geniuses at the academy and all the wonderful crafters and artists of sf bazaar thank you very much for having me on here i deeply appreciate it gratitude to all um and uh, yeah, if you want to check us out, binarywinter.com. I'm at Cody Vrosh on all the social medias. And uh, um, and CodyVrosh.com will get you there too. Check out SF Bazaar. We're doing a sale right now. Code is festive um, on our website, binarywinter.com. And they're doing a $50 raffle at, uh, at the SF Bazaar um, website. Um, so make sure you check that out too, because you can get 50 bucks to spend on some sweet, sweet stuff. But thank you guys ever so much. Have a good night. Happy experimenting. All right, everyone can hear me okay? I'm just gonna switch this over. And, oh, I can hear. You're muted again. I don't know what happened. You were, you were there for a minute. Am I back on now? Yes. See, we did the whole tech check and there's still, you know, surprises. I can still hear myself too, but can you guys hear it? Okay, well, I'm just gonna keep the show going. All right, thank you, thank you for the feedback. I'm Risa Culbertson. I have a greeting card line called Papa Llama. I'm also, I'm off again, really? What's happening? You guys hear me? I'm like looking at the comments here. No more sound. Christina. You're good. Okay. You're good. I'm I'll good. pop on again if you disappear. Oh, okay. Thank you. I feel like a hot mess right now. But okay, we're starting. Okay. We're starting over. <laughs> it's a live show. It happens. <laughs> this is the joy of live, right? Okay. Just in case anyone missed it, I'm Risa Culbertson and I have a greeting card line called Papa Lama. 
I'm also a multimedia artist. You can see some of my work at risaculbertson.com. And uh, here we go with this is the joys of being live. Thank you guys so much for uh, popping in on the comments and uh, letting me know that, you know, you can hear me okay. This is kind of like us hanging out. So we're gonna be doing a little craft evening together. This is um, partying in 2020. So tonight I wanna kind of show you guys something that I do uh, to help me feel connected, uh, especially during this time. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm a hugger. I'm just like, get in here and like love hugging people, but you know, not this year. So I'm gonna show you the next best thing, which is sending a hug. And for those of you who have watched this tutorial on my Risa Rainbow YouTube channel, um, have no fear because I'm not going to do a repeat. This is a Cal Academy spin to sending a hug. And uh, the things that you guys will need are a couple pieces of paper, get two, construction paper, copy paper, craft paper, junk paper, whatever you got going around. Okay, and either some tape or glue, scissors or an exacto knife, and a bunch of marker one, that's one, an envelope and a stamp because we're eventually going to be sending this. You can hold on to it for yourself too, but you know. All right, so you got your stuff? All right, let's get started. Ooh, look at that. Awesome. So I actually do this so often that I added it to my line. Um, it's sending a hug with instructions, um, but we're going to be doing our own today. So We'll set that aside. And usually I'll just kind of trace my hand or draw my, you know, draw a little hand and that's gonna be like the part that hug. But because we're gonna do our Cal Academy, you know, spin, we're gonna be using, you know, a creature today. So I want you to kind of think about your favorite animals, your favorite creatures, you know, instead of hands, maybe their paws, you know, maybe instead of paws, their claws. That rhymes. It could be a, it could be a song later. Hooves, tentacles, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm going to be doing. Let's see. I'm going to do a crab because nothing makes me smile more than a crustacean. I guess. So the whole thing is we're going to be making two, like a set of hands or claws. You can draw it out. You know, kind of. Cartoony, I love cartoony stuff. You can either just fold it and then cut two at the same time. But you know, there's always like one, one claw bigger than the other. So I'm gonna cut them out. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm all about things not being perfect. So, you know, the more like textures you can get, Go for it. And let me know if you guys are doing this alongside and if you are, you know, what kind of animals you're choosing to do. I was thinking about like what my favorite thing at Cal Academy is. I love the jellyfish, but um, I felt like that was really challenging as far as how to send a hug um, by a jellyfish. I don't know if I really want to be hugged by a jellyfish, but. All right, almost there. You can make this as detailed as you want or as straightforward as you want. You know, we only got a few a few minutes together, so I like this. All right, I've got my claws. You guys can see that. Oh, all right. Next up, you have your second piece of paper. And what you're gonna do is just cut strips. So basically we just want one long strip after this. So you can either just cut strips and then we're gonna be taping them together. Or if you already have like one long, you know, like this kind of like butcher paper sort of stuff, um, just feel free to grab one of those. You can use ribbon, paper ribbon, there's all sorts of stuff you can use. 
start by getting crafty. All right. I'm almost there. Exacto knives are super helpful for them. Okay. So, once we have our pieces, we're going to just start taping them together. Put my claws over here. I just feel like blue is a good choice for sleeves. Like, I feel like a crustacean would wear like a button up, long sleeve blue shirt. I don't know. And we're just going to make this, I feel like the longer, the more fun. Uh, these are going to be our arms. So we want them long enough to be able to like wrap around our friends and family and just show them that we miss them and we care about them and we can't wait to safely be together and hug each other. Okay, last one here. Just like that. Now I have this long arm. And I'm going to take the ends like that. And now I'm going to add each claw. You see where this is going? Each claw. There we go. To each sleeve. Like that. And like that. And now when you send this, your friend can just wrap this around like this. And then they can hold it close and it's sending a hug. You know, and I would just write a little note on there so they just don't think that it's some very new species of crustacean that you just sent them. Sending you a hug. I don't know if you can see that. So then with this, we'll package it up into our envelope and send it off to our friends. And then just be excited about the day that we can be together and give each other a real hug. So that's how you send a hug. Let me know what uh, you guys end up creating or if you do something similar, find me on social media, Papa Lama Mama. Um, and yeah, let me know what sorts of things you come up with. And stay connected, stay safe out there. And thanks for being here with me. Hello, um, my name is Amy Perrier and my shop is called Bernal Burrow. Uh, today I'm gonna be demonstrating something new I just started selling in my shop. It's um, my Moss DIY kit. Um, <clears throat> that. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, the different kinds of mosses that I use and demonstrating um, how to put the kit together. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is reindeer moss. It's this fluffy moss that you see all around in the stores. And first thing, it's actually not a moss. It's called lichen. Um, why it's called moss, I actually have no idea. <laughs> so lichen is actually in the fungus family. Now, how they preserve this is they first take the water out of it and then they replace it with glycerol. And when they replace it with glycerol, it loses the color. And so that's why um, you see all this vibrant colors. They, they re-dye it so they can really dye it any type of color they want. Um, <clears throat> also, the cool thing about reindeer moss is that it's uh, actually mostly grown in the northern hemisphere and it's food for the caribou and the deer up there. Um, now the Scandinavian people did use it for um, a few different things like they would make alcohol with it, um, <clears throat> they would use it for upset stomachs, they would even kind of like mush it together and eat it in stews and things. Um, now lichen is really interesting. 
It's um, very hardy. And what they what the scientists did is they actually put it on the side of a spaceship and put it up into outer space for a year and a half to see what it would do and how long it would live. And it actually lived for, well, it lived up there for a year and a half. And then when they brought it back down, 70% um, of it was still alive. Um, I found that fact really interesting. What um, the lichen does not like <laughs> is pollution. So lichen has actually not grown in New York City for about 200 years because the air has been so polluted. And that's how the lichen gets its nutrients is um, from the atmosphere. <clears throat> so until 2019, the lichen just started growing again on the buildings, um, which is great news for New York City. That means their air is getting a lot cleaner. So <clears throat> this reindeer moss, I bought at the store, but some of this moss that is in my kit, I actually foraged around here in um, Northern California and San Francisco. Um, the next moss I want to talk about is uh, wolf moss. And you might have seen this growing in the uh, Sierra Nevadas. It's, I actually foraged this about two years ago and I didn't know what I was going to do with it until now. Um, it just grew everywhere. It's pretty cool. The Native Americans would use this as a yellow dye. Um, they also used it as a poultice to stop the bleeding. So if you had any kind of cuts or boils, um, they would put it on the, the wound and um, it would help uh, stop the bleeding. But uh, it is mildly poisonous. Uh, they are not sure how poisonous it is. So probably best to keep this away from small children and animals in your house. <laughs> um, and why they call it wolf lichen is because, well, it's grown in the Western part of uh, North America and also Europe. And in Europe, what they would do, sorry, this is kind of sad. They would smush it up and put it with ground meat and um, broken glass and leave it out for the wolves to eat to um, kill them. But they're not sure if the glass or the light can kill them because they're not, scientists aren't really sure how poisonous this is, which um, they just said mildly poisonous. Um, and also the Native Americans, they would boil this down and um, drink it. Um, and then they said that also helps stop the bleeding um, from their wound. <clears throat> uh, another thing, or another moss that I use that actually is not a moss, it's called Spanish moss. So I actually just went down to New Orleans for the first time in, uh, right before COVID and it grew everywhere on the trees and it was really, really cool. Um, not a moss and actually not a lichen. And I, I bought this from the store um, and it is preserved. Um, so how did it get its name Spanish moss? <clears throat> so the story goes is that the uh, Spanish and the French were down in the South conquering, taking over different parts, and they didn't like each other. Um, the first time that the French saw this, it reminded them of um, the Spanish beards that were very popular at the time that all the Spaniards had. So they called it um, Spanish moss. Now, the um, Spanish people did not like that. They, they, so they started calling it French hair. Um, and well, the French one in that one, so Spanish moss, it uh, stuck. Um, oh, and actually, uh, some other cool tidbits about this is we as humans have used it for all kinds of things like mulch and packaging material, um, to, uh, stuff mattresses and in the early 1900s um, when cars first started rolling out uh, they used it as padding in the seats of cars well I thought that was really interesting I, I'm actually such a history buff I just love those kinds of things and um, history knowledge <laughs> um, so next I have it's called Parmelia lichen so kind of hold it up so you probably see this grown everywhere in um, California. And this is something that I, I actually did um, forage on my hikes in Pacifica. Um, it's really grown all over the world, but it does like uh, temperate, 
temperate climates like uh, California. So the Native Americans would use this as a reddish and brown um, brown dye. And it was actually considered a cure at one point for epilepsy and um, the plague, especially as Berkler um, said, especially if it was grown on um, a skull, they thought it was extra special. Um, and especially if that skull was from uh, executed uh, criminal, they thought it had extra powers. <laughs> Um, so next is my only moss actually in the kit. Um, it's called mood moss and this is grown in North America in the, um, uh, <clears throat> foresty areas and they call it mood moss because it's very temperamental to the temperature and the moisture in the air, um, and on the ground. So, <clears throat> If the forest is uh, wet, it really likes it, it's green, it's smushy. Um, if it gets dried out, it gets brown and I guess unhappy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is, um, I did not forage this. This is actually, I, I did buy this, but it is native to uh, Northern um, North America. All right, so the next item that I have is these um, eucalyptus seeds, gum seeds. So you probably see these all over San Francisco. And these, I just picked up a huge um, bag of them in Golden Gate Park that I had collected. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the eucalyptus trees that are all over here. So it is a mildly invasive species in California. It was brought over by Australians in the 1850s. They came over um, for the gold rush and they harvested them in California and they were using them for um, firewood, to grow fire, to grow them to, for firewood. And well, they kind of went out of control and they're not the best trees to have in California because <laughs> they're uh, they're kind of flammable. Um, the bark shreds off of the tree uh, and creates this like tons of debris. And then also the oils are very, um, they ignite. <laughs> so if a fire hits the tree, it kind of explodes. But eucalyptus does have a lot of great new um, medicinal uses, as you know. Um, they're great for cuts and uh, skin rashes and bad breath. And um, if you're feeling like if you have a cold, it's really great. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I am done putting my moss kit together. So I sell these. Oop, there it is for $40 on my store um, with free shipping. And um, I actually offer about three uh, different designs. So you should go check them out. Um, again, I'm Bernal Burrow and um, you can find me on Etsy. Thanks and have a great night. Everybody. Uh, welcome to SF Nightlife. I guess it's almost over now. Uh, I'm going to be showing you all how to do a tutorial on making a little terrarium ornament or a little tabletop display. And it will never go bad. You don't have to worry about plants dying or anything like that because it's going to be an everlasting terrarium. 
by the way, my name is Katie Kristen. I realize I forgot to say that. And uh, you can see my website at katiekristin.com, K-A-T-Y-K-R-I-S-T-I-N. And yeah, so I hope you enjoy the tutorial and have fun. Roll the show. There are lots of different types of containers you can find for this project. These are some clear acrylic spheres. And make sure you're looking for the kind that come apart in two halves so you can get your project in and out really easily. I've also seen these clear acrylic mason jars. And the acrylic things are really great because if you drop it or the cat tries to bat it off the tree, you don't have to worry about things breaking into a million pieces. Here's some different sized little candy jars I found if you're going to do a tabletop scene or if you want to transfer your scene from the ornament to a little tabletop scene for other parts of the year. It's good to have these on hand. So you want to decide what your little terrarium scene is going to be and then gather together your materials. Probably my all-time favorite is little miniature mushrooms and they come in a lot of different sizes and colors. I think these are maybe vintage spun cotton mushrooms, but they're still pretty easy to find. I've got a lot of little gnomes here in all different sizes depending on the scale of your scene. Some little woodland animals like my favorite, the hedgehog. Some squirrels, deer, trees. Uh, I've gathered together a few little tiny beads, so if you want to turn one of the trees into a Christmas tree, you'll glue those on. This is wool roving, and it comes in a lot of different colors, and that would be if you're going to needle felt your base. You can also craft your base from felt, layers of felt glued together, and like this particular one here, pom-poms. So this one I just got a whole bunch of different sized pom-poms and glue them together so you can make sort of a little mounded mountain type scene. Okay, so your tool list for this project is glue gun with some extra glue sticks, craft glue, especially if you're going to add glitter. I really like to use this glass glitter. Not only is it much safer for the environment, but it looks really nice, has a lot of dimension to it. And again, you're not going to have to worry about fish swimming around with glitter in their tummies. Scissors, just in case. And if you are going to needle felt your base, you want a needle felting needle. Just kind of in a medium size. I think this is a 36 or a 38. So I have this little brown alligator I found. And i use some craft paint to paint him white. So we can make Claude the albino alligator. The Academy of Sciences. I left the bottom of him unpainted so that he will glue a little bit better. So the first thing I do is start needle felting. I use this little upturned brush. They actually sell it for needle felting as a base to needle felt on, but you can also use just like a piece of styrofoam or some kind of like thick sponge or something like that. Just so you have something to stab into. And I just kind of start a little piece of the roving off, making kind of the dirt. And then the other side of it's going to be uh, blue water. And you just start stabbing.
So the first thing I usually place is the tree because it takes up the most space. And because your sphere is tallest in the middle, I try to put the tree so that it'll end up kind of being in the middle and definitely fit inside. You can be a little bit messy because the fuzziness of the wool kind of will hide glue gun blops a little bit. Okay, you can always kind of smooth over the fuzzy part onto the tree trunk if you see any messy glue bits. Okay, and all these little rocks, I literally just pulled them out of our yard. We had a bunch of kind of pea gravel out in the front yard, and I just picked up some rocks that were kind of different shapes, a little bit flat, so that they would be easier to glue down. Okay, now's the time to position Claude. I'm going to put him up here on the rocks like he's sunning himself, like he likes to do. And now, I'm going to add some tiny mushrooms. I'm going to use one of these little plastic mushrooms. And then I'm going to use one of these little super tiny mushrooms. And that's pretty much it. If you think you're going to keep them in the ball for a while as the ornament, you can add a little piece of like quake hold or museum wax or something like that in the bottom if you want to kind of tack your little seam down so it doesn't slide around. For the finishing touch, I like to go pretty simple. And I got a little piece of this kind of red and white striped twine, pretty easy to find. And then I just kind of cut a length about like that. It's probably going to be about six or seven inches. And then I do a simple not like that. So there you go. Hey everyone. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed all the tutorials. Um, let's bring Jamie back on to do the giveaway. Yes. Oh, there you go. Jamie, you're on mute. Okay. I am unmuted now. And announce the winner. Thank you for everyone who entered the uh, raffle. Lots of great interest. And for everybody who watched tonight, we really appreciate you supporting the artists. And the people in the market, a place, uh, we'll include the link again, have wonderful discounts for the holidays. So you can just purchase online and have it shipped safely to your home. So we had over 100 people enter. And wow. raffle number 22, um, I apologize if I'm not saying it right, but Jill Grenier, G-R-E-N-I-E-R. -E we know Jill? Oh, OK. No, no, just <laughs> the fact that yeah. Jill won. Yes. Congratulations, Jill. Um, we're going to reach out to you by your email and we'll figure out where to send the $50 credit. Cool. Congrats, Jill. And thanks so much, Jamie. Thanks so much, Jamie. This was fun. Thanks so much, everyone. Happy holidays.
Um, so special thanks to Alexis, Cody, Risa, Amy, Katie, and of course, Jamie, again, thank you, and SF Bazaar. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in at home, whether it's your first time or you're back. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us. Uh, we'll be back in 2021 to kick off the new year with some new species hear about some of the new species that Academy researchers have described over the past year. Um, until then, hope you all have a nice and safe holiday season. Um, and I also wanted to mention that, uh, I just wanted to give a special, we want to give a special shout out to our uh, partner behind the scenes, the third member of the Nightlife team, Richie, who also goes Yay. by DJ Nightlife, who created the Claude, what we call DJ Yule Claude for tonight. So yay for Richie and Yule Claude. Um, and also just wanted to say that if you wanted to go back and watch any of the tutorials, this video will stay right where you're watching it. Um, so you can come back and follow along and make your own mini terrarium um, at your own speed. Um, and so, yeah, if you miss us over the next few weeks, again, like all 29 nightlife episodes that we've done this year are on YouTube. So subscribe so you'll be notified when we come back. And again, um, thank you so much for joining us this year. We know it's been a really hard year for everyone. Um, but thank you again for all your support to donors, members. Um, we couldn't do it without you. So yeah, so I think that's it, Lynn, for now. For now, we'll see you <laughs> in 2021. Good night, everyone. <laughs>